the 1990s was the decade that saw home computing really take off. Consoles were everywhere, PCs moved out of the office and into the home, while local arcades still just about had a place. The games themselves got more serious, with some big early players in the racing game world really getting going, and some future legends just starting off. These are the games from that era that we think really pioneered the industry we see today. If you do enjoy this video, look back and think, God, that was great, then please do hit the like button. It helps us out massively. And then subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to make sure you see everything from Goodwood Road and racing. Through the 1990s, two names really stand out in the racing game world. Jeff Crammond and his Grand Prix racing series. The first game, rather creatively titled Jeff Crammond's Grand Prix, arrived in 1991 and was the first game to deliver something similar to real-life car physics. It was also dripping in detail for the time. Gear ratios could be adjusted, tyre compounds and wing settings could be tuned, and each change had a proper effect on the way the cars handled. Its frame rate was 25 frames per second, which is laughable today, but incredible at the time, and the 3D textures looked like nothing else around. In fact, so technically advanced and graphically impressive was it that Grand Prix often caused users issues with their processors as they were pushed to their absolute limits. This led to a legendary trait for slow motion gaming. That is, when the frame rate stayed the same, but the game simply went slower. Regardless of the issues, Grand Prix and its successors have their place in the pantheon of true simulators. In fact, so high up that some still deem the later games unsurpassed in their handling models. There was a real stream of games in the 1980s and 1990s that featured just one single brand or even a single car. If you were a diehard fan of the XJ220, there was a game for you. Love Ferraris? That too. One of the best was dedicated to Norfolk's finest, Lotus. Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge launched the series in 1990, and the following year a sequel broadened its horizons. That is, to include the Elan as well as the Esprit. On the face of it, the sequel was sort of less of a game, dropping the challenge of fuel limits and any variation in difficulty levels. But instead, time trials were added, and of course, the Elan. You could even change the colours of the cars. It would become a trilogy with Lotus 3, which entirely dropped the turbo name, and it took bits of both of its predecessors and added more cars and the ability to make your own tracks. But that was the end of it. It might not have been the most sophisticated of racing games, but it was very, very 90s. The greatest bike racing games ever? Quite possibly. This was a violent street racing game, more Tekken meets Grand Prix than anything particularly serious. Locations ranged from California, and only California in the first game, to the rest of America and eventually worldwide. Pretty bold for a game from the early 1990s. The first game set the formula for success. Firstly, there was a two-player option, long before LAN parties or online tournaments really took off. And you didn't just race against each other. This was co-op style. You and a friend could progress through the game together. The second part of the formula for success was simple. Rather than just racing your opponents, you could just hit them. As the entries progressed, ever more weapons were added, as well as new characters and new locations. In 1998, Road Rash went 3D, and with it the violence was toned down to focus more on the racing. For many, it never had quite the same fun. This is the first of what we could call the mega franchises to appear in our list. Mario Kart is not just a racing game that continues today, it is the biggest selling racing game ever. Not just that, it actually holds the Guinness World Record as being the top selling console game full stop. The formula was set right from the start. Eight very lovable characters from the Mario world, an expanded multiplayer, competitive graphics and gameplay tilted way towards the fun end of the spectrum. It might have seemed odd that Mario, Luigi, Yoshi and Co were going karting back in 1992, but today it seems odd to think that they wouldn't. Before we continue, we'd just like to say thank you very much for watching this video. We really do appreciate it. And if you hit that like button, we'll love you just ever so slightly more. And if you do like it, then remember to subscribe and hit that bell icon to make sure you see everything that we put out. Well then, 
How about Ridge Racer? Ridge Racer is a franchise now long lost to the world. Well, in terms of the ones we would pay attention to anyway. It started as an install to the Namco System 22 arcade machine and plays as the typical arcade racing game. But that game would then be ported to the original PlayStation in 1994 as one of the launch titles for that new console. This was the earliest of console racing games that began to look something like what we would recognise today. It had everything you need for an enduring racing game series from the 1990s. Cool cars that were definitely not just copies of real life ones. Good names, cool locations, decent racing, and the ability to just not take itself too seriously. It had to start somewhere, didn't it? So ingrained in the world of racing games is the name Need for Speed that it feels like it must have just sprung fully formed into consciousness, probably with a name like Need for Speed 8 or something. But no. Once upon a time, there was a game simply called The Need for Speed. And when it arrived, no one could have known the effect that it would have on both the gaming industry and the car universe for the next 30 years. What many don't know is that the first Need for Speed game was actually a collaboration between Road and Track magazine and Electronic Arts. Road and Track helped EA with the realism of the cars, the handling and even things like the trueness of the gear shift. There were eight cars to choose from and even magazine style videos and photo content set to music to show them off properly in the menu systems. That makes it seem like something totally different, but underneath it all, the gameplay had a lot of nuggets we'd recognise as Need for Speed today. Arcade style racing, speeding tickets and the police. The titan that is Need for Speed has evolved in many different directions over the years, but it only survived because it had a properly strong start. Once upon a time, you didn't just turn on your console and leaf through hundreds of games on PSN before deciding which one to buy and then eventually get bored of. Back then, you either went down your local arcade to play the latest offering from Sega & Co, or if you lived in the middle of rural England, you desperately hoped your mum might let you play on the games in the lobby of the cinema. One of the absolute legends of this genre of pay-to-play gaming was Sega Rally. In fact, so important and titanic was Sega Rally that even now it remains in the minds of many gamers, and it's not hard to see why. Sega Rally was, for many, the first time they would ever race in a game with a wheel and pedals. And it came with a car list that had a sheer density of brilliance that's barely been matched. So legendary was Sega Rally Championship that about 15 years later, you could still expect to see a Sega Rally machine in the arcade in places that still had them, like cross-channel ferries. Obviously, the memory of this early rallying pioneer wouldn't have endured if the game underneath it wasn't, you know, really good. Sega Rally Championship offered players different surfaces and friction levels that you could notice the difference of inside the same stage. World Championship mode presented three stages, in desert, forest and mountains, with three cars, the Lancia Delta and Stratos and the Toyota Celica GT4. Sega Rally was one of the greatest racing franchises of all time. And even those at Codemasters will tell you quite happily that it was Sega Rally Championship that inspired them to make Colin McRae Rally. Here we go. While my scriptwriter's childhood was transformed by Test Drive Unlimited a few years later, it was the Gran Turismo series that truly changed the world of gaming and perhaps my life in cars forever. Graphics, car list, physics, sound, everything about those early Gran Turismo games was miles ahead of everything we had seen before. Nothing really came close. At the time, it was incredible to think that Kazunori Yamauchi wasn't totally satisfied with what he produced when he did realise it towards the end of 1997. This, despite five years of hard graft to create the greatest racing game the world had yet seen. His hard work, as much as he refused to accept it, paid off, creating a game that blew the competition away. You could lose hours, days, weeks in Gran Turismo without doing everything possible. And this was at a time when games sometimes took less than four hours to complete. While Gran Turismo set the stone for a legendary franchise to follow, Grand Prix Legends is a game that those who love it had no interest in replacing, even 20 years later. 
In reality, that's a good thing, because Grand Prix Legends was a total flop. It didn't sell in any numbers, and no one has ever really thought about a major label sequel. But it wasn't because it was a bad game. Grand Prix Legends had nothing to do with contemporary racing, something that no one had really done in the late 1990s. Instead, it looked 30 years into the past, recreating the 1967 season in, for the time, exquisite detail. Inspired by the 1966 movie Grand Prix, the developers were drawn into the racing environments of cars flying past houses and shops, which, when put in the game, increased the sense of speed. Also considered were the, shall we say, slightly more exciting handling characteristics of the 3 litre Formula 1 cars from 1967. Such was the level of detail in Grand Prix Legends that in order to recreate the tracks long since in disuse, the developers went as far as getting the schematics of the roads that were used from local authorities. The game was lauded by critics but was off-puttingly difficult for many who bought it, and the subject matter just alienated a lot of potential buyers. But even today, there is still a big and loyal playing base with plenty steadfast in their belief that nothing has ever got it as right as Grand Prix Legends did. Together with Sega Rally, V-Rally helped to popularise rallying with more than just those hardcore who had long spent their time traipsing into the woods to view cars as they flew past. While Sega fostered the love of rallying, Colin McRae Rally, Richard Burns Rally and the incoming official WRC games went for realism, V-Rally chose to straddle the line between fun and simulation. On release, in 1999, V-Rally 2 had 26 cars from the 1999 WRC season and 80 original stages that emulated the real ones from that season. Different modes were available depending on how seriously you wanted to take your day. Arcade allowed for a quick play, while full seasons would appeal to the genuine fan. Moving a step on from Sega's innovative changes in surface, V-Rally had day and night stages as well as snow, mud and wet conditions. To add to it all, there was even a course creator so you could map out your dream rally stage. V-Rally wasn't a pure rallying simulator, but it helped the genre appeal to a wider audience. Those are the racing games from the 1990s that we look back at and think that is the genesis of where we are today. But which ones have we missed out, or which ones do you really remember playing when you were younger? Let us know in the comments below.